Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 57 of the Cloud Computing Australia show featured on YouTube and podcasts with Brad Nelson and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialists placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. In this week's show, we will be talking about that AWS is the latest of only six providers to have passed a series of requirements that's been set by the Australian government to handle classified material. 42 of its services have been certified up to protected, including storage, network, database, security, analytics, management and governance. The government has not yet allowed for any provider to host material classified above protected. Hi Dave, it's great to have you back on the Australia show this week. Yeah, it's great to be back and I'm noticing uh, there's a very difference in semantics between uh, how government talks about classified information versus how the Australian government talks about classified information. It's very interesting, protected versus top secret. Yeah, it truly is. Uh, th there is some interesting points in this show. I know we're going to come across them and there, there's, there's some sim similarities and some, some ones that, where it's just not quite aligned. You're absolutely right. So, look, I, I guess the opening question is, do you see Australia allowing other public cloud providers the same privileges? Oh, they have to. I think that um, ultimately, you know, it's very much like the FedRAMP program here in the United States with the U.S. government. So we they have a uh, way in which we certify cloud providers and they have to go through different steps and they have to go through certifications and different behaviors and different uh, levels of security. And I, I think that if any cloud provider wants to play in the uh, Australian space, they're going to go ahead and uh, uh, basically assimilate to those issues. And so probably AWS had a lot of the, the basic cloud services, the um, uh, security services to get those right. And I think ultimately uh, they made quick work of the regulations and getting and getting certified. Now we have to have Microsoft and Google and you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, even uh, the Chinese based systems like Alibaba Cloud, AliCloud, things like that are going to have to figure it out. One thing you don't want is uh, one single provider who's the only one that's compliant. You know, it's playing the game because you want different providers with different technologies that they provide different price points and different ways of supporting the market. And so just having AWS is the only one who's certified to deal with quote unquote protected information in Australia isn't going to allow the Australians to scale and get to these very diverse best of breed solutions. And so you'll probably see Google follow and Microsoft follow probably Microsoft soon before Google, but it's going to correct itself. You'll, you'll wait and see as long as there's money to be made, people are going to uh, change their technology to find the capabilities of making that money. Yeah, I think you'd hit the nail on the head. As long as there's money to be made, someone, someone somewhere is uh, inevitably going to win the large piece of the pie. And it, it brings us nicely, actually, to a, a thing that's happening in the U.S. at the moment. There's there's quite a, a fight going on, as it were, but for the uh, the business of the Pentagon. I think it's some sort of like a 10 billion uh, joint enterprise defense infrastructure project, which is uh, aptly named Jedi. So there must be some mind games being going. I think there's some mind games being played between uh, what's it? Uh, Oracle at the the Oracle at the moment. So Oracle's playing the Jedi games with AWS. It's just, you couldn't write it any better, could you? <laughs> yeah, and it, it's going to be a high drama for sure. I mean, Google dropped out because they uh, the employees at Google didn't uh, like the idea they were working with the government, according to them, according to lots of news releases. Uh, AWS is obviously the big contender. They're the big in, biggest in the government space. They have secure based systems. They support the CIA with the CIA's only private cloud. And um, ultimately, the other cloud providers are going to look and nip at the heels. And if they're compliant and they're lower cost, then we're going to see a court battle carry on for two years. One, one of the things that used to frustrate me like crazy when I worked in the government space, it just took so long to get things done. And so it takes two years to get a proposal out there, a year to build the technology, and then it takes two years to go through the protests and go through the court battles. Uh, I don't know how many times it was deposed and different uh, contractual things uh, with protests that go on in the, DC, in the DC area, but that's just kind of the way it is. And I think this is kind of the mother of all uh, cloud contracts. It may be the biggest in the world so far. You know, so that said, um, the, the legal battles, no matter who is right and who is wrong, are just gonna carry things out for years to years. It's, uh, you know, probably a good reason why um, you know it's very difficult to do business with any government. Yeah, I know it just takes forever, and I think it doesn't help as well because Oracle are on the case of AWS uh, filing lawsuits. Uh, you know, 
claiming that you know everyone's weighing towards AWS, and I mean everyone's got to throw their toys out the pram at some point, haven't they? Yeah, everything's protested uh, in those. I mean the 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 amount of uh, legal battles that carry on in the DC area just around these uh, government contracts that are rewarded to somebody else. And there's there's a lot of people who are just as a business practice, all they do is protest. Uh, so as a way to kind of uh, see if they can get a piece of the pie, because in many instances, there's mediation that occurs and they may give them a piece of the contract if they lost the contract initially. Or in some instances, they throw it out and have it recompeted. And if that's the case, then uh, you know, everybody loses because it's a delay the acquisition of cloud-based systems for a couple of years while we go through the same recompete, you know, processes again. And it's just no uh, no easy way to get those things done. So it is going to be interesting to see how the government adopts cloud-based systems once this contract gets in place. So it is going to get in place. Someone's going to win. So what is their pickup going to be on the cloud systems? What about security? What about governance? And because of the latency and some of the procurement stuff, are we really having having to deal with technology we're defining as requirements four years ago that you know really kind of exists today? And so we're going to have to refresh the technology again. And it's ultimately you know going to be something that's a test for the government to see if they can make cloud work or not. If you remember, you know back in 2008 when I first started to you know get into cloud in a big way. Um, the CIO of uh, the United States, um, Vivek Kundra, I believe was his name, you know, he basically had a cloud first mentality. And so he had the NIST group uh, define cloud computing. That's where he got infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, and ultimately the ability to kind of take that to the government space. And the government was kind of leading the way. There were no commercial entities really that much interested in cloud, but the government was looking to, in essence, take cloud to allow them to make things cheaper, quit building data centers, all those sorts of things. The problem is the CIOs didn't get the funding and the budgets to go ahead and make that happen. So it just kind of fell by the wayside. And now the private sector is way, way, way ahead of the government. So what's going to be interesting when this award, this contract is there and they can buy these cloud services off the cloud, cloud services off that contract. Yeah. How will the government participate in the cloud based technology growth? Will they, will they, enhance it or will they move it forward? You know, will this be something that just also peters out going forward? So I'm gonna watch this pretty closely because not necessarily around the excitement around some sort of a big deal being awarded to somebody, but the behavior that the government will have when it takes cloud computing to the next level. Yeah, you've hit on some really good points there actually, Dave. Uh, and I'd just like to ask you, in your experience, uh, in your experience, beg your pardon, in your opinion and experience, uh, and based on historic, uh, um, knowledge of, of how large organisations have adopted cloud and, and, and the best foot forward. How do you see the Australian government really embracing cloud? What do you think is going to benefit not only from a government point of view, but also from a, you know, a civilian point of view? I think they have the same pressures. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, they have budgetary limitations and you're asking the CIOs of the different agencies um, that, uh, it, that are exist in Australia um, and ultimately asking them to move into cloud or more efficient technologies, and they have to be funded to do so. So they have to get realistic about what this stuff costs, how much of a, of a, uh, of a pain in the neck it's gonna to be to change the infrastructure and change the networks and change the security systems to move into cloud, and then allow them to make it happen. I think that's the big uh, limitation right now. So the CIOs don't have the resources to take things to the next level. And so if the government's serious about it, very much like in the States and other government agencies as well, same in the UK, same in Canada, you know, same in the European Union, um, ultimately this stuff has to be funded, has to be made a priority, and only then will the cloud actually make a difference in the government space. Meanwhile, the, the commercial uh, entities are going by leaps and bounds because they have an incentive. Uh, the, the better they can do with cloud, the more money they can make, in essence, the, the, the more wealth they can build within the company, where the government doesn't necessarily have that incentive, but they should. Yeah, and, and you're right. I'm thinking, well, look, a private entity is, is trying to create a user experience or making something that's more fluid for the user because that's going to, in effect, you know, give the business more value coming back to that because of the user experience. But government really are, you know, maybe adopting cloud for the functionality of government, maybe not for the, the realization of, of a, a function for the end user, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I think they're not having the end users in mind. Um, and also it becomes a more expensive proposition to stay out of the cloud. Um, if you're not, because you're building more data centers, you're 
not able to adjust quickly to changes in mission. I'm sure the Australian government has, you know, different priorities that shift every year around security, um, defense, other things. And ultimately, it's going to end up costing you more money. So, you know, say it can save you, you know, 20, you know, billion dollars a year, you know, over the next 10 years. And but you need to spend 20, you need to spend 40 billion dollars in the first year to actually get it implemented. Well, that's going to be, you know, 20 times, you know, 20 times 10, you know, 20, uh, you know, 200 billion dollars. And ultimately, just by spending 40 billion dollars. And it's not that compelling. But the thing is, you have to it's not that compelling if you look at the year to year budgets, but you look at the long term effects and the benefits of this technology. It's just so compelling to make it happen. And I, I think we're thinking too short term. I think that budgets are done on year to year basis, things like that. And I think ultimately we have to look at this stuff as a long term investment looking at how it's going to make a systemic change, how we're going to have to change the skill sets, change security, change governance around utilization of this technology. And people have to have the courage to make that happen. Yeah, very true. And at the end of the day, we've got to realize that nine times out of 10, the taxpayer is going to be subsidizing this investment for the government to be able to function in more of a cloud environment anyway. So it makes more sense to invest as much of the taxpayer's money up front and save on the long term for the impact of the further generations to reap the benefits of, of that initial investment, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that falls on, you know, falls on the uh, deaf ears when you deal with the bureaucratic infrastructures that we have and the politicians that are, you know, run all the countries. But ultimately, the, you know, the poor bastards who are, you know, sitting down in the data centers and, you know, trying to make uh, magic happen with very little resources, you know, ultimately need different tool sets to make things happen. Let's give them better tools that are cheaper, more efficient to use. It's going to cost us a bit of money to get there, but it's going to get us to a much better place. Yeah, so very true. And at least with AWS, there's a starting point and, and it's, it's got a price point that is, you know, able to sort of save on budgets, you would have thought anyway. Hence why I think the government's, uh, you know, choosing AWS over anyone else for not only its uh, capabilities, but also from a, a potential price point as well. But it moves us on nicely to your uh, top tips, Dave, if you'd be happy to share those with us this week, that'd be great. Yeah, first is just because the government says it's okay doesn't mean it is. So, you know, one of these things about going through these uh, frameworks and validations, and you can put any government above them. I, I've seen that all the governments make mistakes. Um, ultimately, uh, there's huge latency w between when they write these regulations and the technology that's out there to make it happen. And so, you know, the first, you know, regulations around cloud computing-based security, for example, didn't take into account identity access management. And encryption, it was kind of user ID, password, role-based security, traditional stuff. So you have to understand that you need to put your own defense in place, uh, even beyond some of the government regulations there. They're ultimately, they're there to protect you, but they were there to protect you with technology that was four years old. And uh, you have to update it yourself and basically take, it, uh, take advantage of the technology as you see fit. Uh, focus on your own security, that's a big thing. Um, you know, ultimately, this is not about systemic security for the government. This is about security at the agency level and at the uh, the function level and even at the person level and the system level. And so you're responsible for that technology. It's not something you're waiting for the government to basically adjust itself to protect the data. Um, you're going to get in trouble very quickly. So this is about your responsibility and keep monitoring in mind. I think ultimately, you know, any kind of security based systems or proactive in nature because they're dealing with monitoring. So if you look at, you know, some of the better security models out there, they always have proactive based monitoring. Even some AI based systems that are sitting on top of it that can detect breach, breach warnings, breach attacks can automatically self heal. If people get into some sort of a, a, a server, you know, uh, uh, they can automatically shut down that server and protect it uh, because they know the breach is there. And that's done through proactive, pro proactive automated monitoring monitoring that people are in essence um, you know not running so we're letting the systems kind of protect themselves great top tips there Dave I really appreciate that it's been a very interesting show and thanks for being part of the Australia show this week yeah keep things uh, secure in Australia good luck <laughs> good luck all around good luck for the rest of the world with that one uh, well look <laughs> thanks everyone for watching the Australia show or listening to the Australia show uh, you can get Dave on Twitter which is at Davey Linthicum I'm on Twitter which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard make sure you like subscribe and comment uh, and you know be a part of our cloud tribe that we've got going on as well on Twitter Facebook Instagram we're all over the place on social media uh, we're also on um, iTunes and Stitcher for the podcast so you can listen to us as well while uh, on your mobile device which is all good um, and yeah 
yeah, thanks for all your support. We really appreciate that. We've got some great blogs as well, uh, which you can check. Oh, there's lots of links in the description box below. So uh, click away and, and find out what's going on uh, behind the scenes as well with Nelson Hilliard. So again, thanks for watching and until next week.